So I think we should start this afternoon session. Uh, we have three talks, and it's all about LHC uh, this afternoon. Three talks without a break, and we should be on time at 5:30 to catch buses for the United Nations. So the three talks are on LHC, the, uh, the machine, the detectors, and the, the physics searchers. And the first speaker is Lynn Evans. Okay, thank you. So, uh, is there anyone in this room who's never heard of LHC? So I don't need to tell you what it is. Sorry. This. So uh, this is actually a synoptic of the of the cryogenics of LHC. It is color coded, um, and uh, it, it's basically of the temperature of the magnets. Red is room temperature, and light blue is. 1.9 Kelvin. So you see, the whole machine is cold now, and uh, we are testing all the hardware, uh, ready to go. I think the first in injected beam into the machine will be pretty soon, um, in 17 working days from now. So just to use this uh, to go briefly around the machine, starting with point one, of course, this is the Atlas, Atlas uh, cabin. It's a new experimental cabin that was built for, especially for Atlas. Uh, it was not there in the left days. Point two is ALICE, the heavy iron experiment, which is actually housed in the, uh, in the cabin of, of L3, the LEP experiment. So it is a, was an existing cabin, and in fact, the magnet of is, is the magnet of L3. Point three is, is a very inhospitable region. It's, it's deep under the Jura mountain. There, is, there, there was no uh, experimental cavern there for left, and uh, the, there is not now. Uh, it's a region where there are, it's very bad for excavation, so we didn't touch anything there. So there's a lot of water around. Point four was um, the old Aleph experimental area and is um, presently used for the radio frequency for the accelerating system of the LAC. There is only one accelerating station. Point five is a new uh, experimental area which is housing CMS. Point six is the, uh, uh, was, was an existing cavern for Opel and uh, this is used for the beam abort. Uh, so there are two tunnels, you can hardly see them here, going 700 meters long, ending up in, in, a, in a cavern where, where the beam dump block is, and that's where the beams can be put onto, uh, safely onto the dump blocks. Point seven, again, there was no ex experimental area for in the lab days, and uh, we, we made some tunnel enlargement, but not very much. Uh, and at both point three and point seven are the collimation regions, because the uh, the um, for both for machine sa safety and for background in the experiments, then uh, there must be uh, uh, regions of collimation to remove the beam halo, uh, which are far from the detectors, and in fact in regions which are not superconducting. And finally, point eight is the uh, experimental area for LHCb, and. Um, that's where I believe Aleph was. And there are two transfer tunnels, they're both 2.6 kilometers long, uh, one for the counterclockwise beam and another for the clockwise beam coming out of the SPS. Now, the important thing uh, to know, and the important thing for us is that these eight octants are independent. They, they can be they can be cooled down set independently and they can be powered independently. Only when, of course, you have, you have the whole machine, the whole, uh, have the beam, and they all go to work together. So that's what we've been doing over the past six months, is cooling down one octant after another, and making all the, the tests that we have to do before bringing it all together. This is the, uh, what's called the Livingston plot. Uh, the, these are the lepton machines. As a function of your first operation, the center of mass energy, uh, and these are the, the Hadron machines. I think the, the, 
There have only been three, the ISR at CERN, the, the SPB back, S at CERN, and the Tevatron at Fermilab, which is still running. And now comes the LHC. And you see, and, uh, previously we were on a pretty much a straight line on a log, log lin graph. The LHC has moved off that line. Uh, we move more onto the left on line now. And, and this is a whole array of, of uh, particles that have been discovered in these machines. The heaviest, and of course, is the top uh, from Fermilab. The LHC, uh, one important aspect is that it uses the existing infrastructure of CERN. If, if it wasn't for that, the, the machine would cost twice as much. And uh, the, basically, the route for, for the protons in LHC is, is through the linear accelerator, 50 MeV, through the, uh, the booster, which is uh, 1.2 GeV, through the proton synchrotron, which is the oldest machine at CERN, uh, constructed in 1959, into the super proton synchrotron, which was built in the 70s, 1976. Uh, and at that point, the beam is at 450 GeV, and then it is injected in, uh, into one or the other of the LEC rings. So all of this infrastructure uh, was there already to uh, allow the LEC to happen. Now, I think you, you know uh, that the LHC was constrained, very seriously constrained, by the, by the existing left tunnel. And, and there, there were two consequences. First, in order to get the, very high, the highest possible energy, then uh, we need to go to a very high magnetic field. And the di dipole field in the LHC is uh, 8.3 Tesla, which is 3 Tesla higher than ever, ever before. Uh, and the other thing is the transverse dimension of the tunnel, which is only 3.8 meters, and this obliged a very no novel and compact structure in, in the magnet, and I will show you in a moment. Now, to get to, get to uh, uh, 8.3 Tesla, uh, you cannot do it by cooling with normal helium. In fact, you have to cool down lower, and the uh, LSE operates at 1.9 Kelvin, and I, you will see why it, that optimum was uh, decided. Um, 50,000 tons of material at 1.9 Kelvin. Of course, it's, uh, this is, this is a, the very old the first results of Kobe, which show the cosmic microwave background at 2.728. So, uh, is the LC the coldest ring in the universe? Of course, we don't know that. There may be other civilizations that have beaten us to it. Okay, now, uh, this is a cross-section of an LHC dipole magnet that illustrates the, uh, the second thing I said, the, the fact that the, the structure needs to be very compact. Uh, the, the, there are two machines, not one, uh, and, and the, the way that it has been done is to, is to employ this very clever two-in-one structure where you can see the two apertures here, separated by only 19 centimeters. Um, inside a, a collar, uh, Ian York and uh, inside inside the, the York structure uh, in, in a, a cryostat, which is evacuated, of course, and uh, with thermal screens to protect this 1.9 Kelvin cold mass from any uh, heat coming in from the outside. Now, uh, being string theorists, I thought I would teach you some very advanced physics. Uh, how does one get, uh, I mean, the, the dipole field, of course, for protons going in opposite directions must be up in one aperture and down in, in the other. So first of all, how, how do you make a magnet with a perfect dipole field? Well, very simply, the perfect dipole field, you, you just take a, a, bar of, a bar of conductor, a solid bar of conductor, forget about this, this for the moment, uh, carrying a current, current density J, uniform, and if you compute the magnetic field, you can do it by Ampere's theorem, uh, the integral of HDL 2 pi R H is equal to pi R squared J, and therefore you can get the field at any point. Uh, and you will see why I've got this displaced axis for the moment, but you can resolve the X and Y components with just using Ampere's law. Now you take another bar of conductor, and uh, this time the current is traveling in the opposite direction, 
and you do exactly the same thing. You, you, you use Ampere's law to find the, the two components. And then, now what you can do is, is this. Because uh, the, the currents in this region are e equal and opposite, so you can remove the material once you've done the mathematics. Uh, it, it's useful to put a vacuum pipe as well, or a beam. But what you see is that uh, uh, everywhere in, in this volume, the horizontal component of magnetic field is zero, and the, the vertical component of the field is constant. So this is, a per, this is the, the, the current distribution that you would want for a perfect dipole field. You cannot make a perfect uh, dipole field, but this is what an LHC ma magnet looks like. These are the superconducting cables distributed with cop copper wedges spacing them. And of course, this has been optimized to minimize the, uh, the, the uh, 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 minimization of, of the multipoles that inevitably will come in, in this magnet. And uh, just for your information, uh, this minimization was done using a genetic algorithm. You see how perfect a, 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 a two-in-one structure is for a, for a field in, up in one uh, aperture and down in the other, because the magnetic field lines have to loop around the currents. So uh, around this one is no problem, but uh, the other way, it just loops around like this through the two apertures. If the two fields had to be up, up which is the case for there are a few areas where we are separating beams, but we have to do that, then the flux would, would have to come through this central region and, and will pile up. And in fact, you can only get about four Tesla with the fields up, up, but up, down allows you to do these very high um, fields. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the problems, I said that we, we have to reduce the temperature to 1.9 Kelvin, uh, and at 2.17 Kelvin, of course, is the lambda point of helium, where the helium becomes a superfluid. Uh, we, we have to do that in order to get very high fields, but with it come, <coughs> come uh, some disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages, the first one is that copper or copper and niobium titanium inside your cable, uh, the spe specific heat is going down as T cubed in that region. So you lose a factor of 10 between 4 Kelvin and 1.9 Kelvin uh, in the specific heat of the material. What that means is it, its ability to absorb energy, you, you, a given amount of energy will produce a much higher temperature rise at 1.9 than at 4 Kelvin. And you have to absorb energy in, in these magnets during ramping, uh, there are sort of eddy currents. Uh, there will inevitably some, be some beam loss. And uh, also, uh, when the magnets are training, uh, this is when they're being brought up to high field, uh, then they, they, they have these huge electromagnetic forces, 500 tons per, per meter, uh, which produces frictional heat if, if, uh, if a conductor moves uh, and quenches. So it's much more difficult at 1.9 Kelvin to to just absorb these energy sources without quenching, without exceeding the critical temperature uh, at, at 1.9 uh, 4. And in fact, you cannot do it unless you get the helium to help you. Because the specific heat of helium is five orders of magnitude higher than of, of the material uh, at these temperatures. So here you see the specific heat of helium. You can see the lambda point here, 2.17 Kelvin. Uh, and you've, you've, got to, you've got to use this. And the way that you use it, the way that the coils are engineered is that the uh, insulation, they have to have insulation between the turns, but the insulation is porous so that the helium can actually permeate inside, it, the conduct, inside the strands of the conductors, between the strands of the conductors, and can, can participate in the, uh, any heat deposition, first of all through its specific heat, and also through its thermal conductivity. Because the other remarkable feature of superfluid helium is that is, is this uh, enormous thermal conductivity, 10,000 times better than or the best copper, uh, and peaking at 1.9 Kelvin. You see that that's why the temperature has been chosen. So this this helps to evacuate heat from the coil um, if the, if the heat source is, is slow. Uh, and also it produces an extremely co uh, uh, constant temperature uh, along the uh, a sector, I said, is, is over three kilometers in length, uh, and the temperature is constant w w within millikelvin along that length because superfluid helium is unable to support a temperature gradient. 
So those are the tricks in, uh, in producing, uh, in, in getting the helium uh, uh, to, to, to help. It, it, it's part of the design of these magnets. Now, how do you get the uh, 50,000 tons down to 1.9 Kelvin? This is the phase diagram of, of helium, where, uh, and, uh, and th this is the, the line between uh, gas and liquid. At, uh, at one atmosphere, of course, the bo boiling point is 4.22 Kelvin. And then if you pump on the, uh, on the bath of helium, uh, then the temperature goes down. At 50 millibar pressure, you cross the lambda point. And to get down to where we want to be, you have to be at 15 millibar pressure. But we, we cannot pump on, 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 uh, on, on this huge magnet system. The way that we get there is, in fact, where the magnets themselves are sitting here. They're sitting at, <coughs> in superfluid helium at one atmosphere pressure. Uh, and the way that that is achieved is through a heat exchanger. So the, uh, the magnets themselves are filled with normal helium, 4.2 or 4.5 Kelvin pressurized. And uh, here is a, heat, a pipe. That pipe is evacuated to 15 millibar. And, uh, Superfluid helium is expanded through a Jules-Thompson valve and, and trickles along this pipe, evaporating uh, and cooling the magnets through the latent heat of vaporization, cooling the magnets until they also cross the lambda point and they uh, go down to 1.9 Kelvin, but this time at atmospheric pressure. So this is the trick. Uh, every 106 meters of the LHC, and I think I've got a picture of it, uh, we, we, we have a, a pipe 106 meters long connected to the, the, the big pumping unit to reduce the pressure to 50 millibar. Uh, one, of, one of the features of the LHC is the enormous stored energy. In, in, in the magnet, there's 10 gigajoules. And in the beam, there is uh, 350 megajoules. Uh, and uh, this, this, is, this is a graph of, uh, of uh, the, the, the previous machines and where they, where they have been. The LHC at top energy is 350 megajoules. That's 80 kilos of TNT in the beam, uh, which is two orders of magnitude higher than ever achieved before. And the energy density is, in fact, three orders of magnitude higher than ever before. Because in a proton beam, the beam size reduces as the energy increases. So this is... One of our uh, problems, the part of the collimation system and the beam aboard system uh, have to be very, very safe in order to be able to handle these kind of energies. At 1% of, of the LHC uh, uh, beam, we, we will be in new territory. And that will be a few weeks from now. OK, uh, of course, construction has been a mammoth job. I think the magnet production took five years. Um, and uh, this, is, this was the end, uh, April last year, the last magnet went down. There is only one shaft of these, these, these are 15 meter long dipoles. Uh, there is only one shaft and that's at the end of the CERN site. Uh, so these are all lower down through that shaft and uh, then they are transported underground around the ring. Uh, the, the largest distance is, is something like 15 kilometers. Uh, we've done 30,000 kilometers underground at two kilometers an hour, which is, uh, must be not a very nice job. Uh, installed, you can see now the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These people are in the way of the magnets going away, but this, this is another interesting feature of the LHC. You've got to get the currents into the magnets. The main magnet is 12 kiloamps. Um, and there uh, are uh, lots of other various current levels on, 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 on focusing uh, and correcting elements. Uh, and they are fed into the machine through these feed, these feed boxes that look like this, where this is a current lead where the, the, uh, the heavy water cooled cable, you can see some of these cables here, come from the power supplies uh, co are connected on top at room temperature, and then the bottom is at four, is at four uh, Kelvin, and somewhere along here there is a, what's called a lambda plate where the conductors make a transition from four to 1.9 Kelvin. And uh, in order to make these leads efficiently, since there would be boil off uh, gas from them, in fact, uh, they are made using high temperature superconductor, which are strips of material inside these, these chimneys 
There, there is a transition region between the warm and the very cold where there are strips of HTS, uh, which is superconducting at 80 Kelvin so that it can be cooled just with the boil of gas of the helium. And this produces a very uh, efficient transition from the warm to the cold. There are 44 of these boxes. A picture of the, uh, LA, uh, the, uh, an interconnect uh, between, between two magnets. Uh, this is the cryogenic distribution line, which is uh, carrying the, uh, the helium and also has the big pumping line uh, to, to evacuate the uh, heat exchanger. And here you can see the heat exchanger, which uh, travels uh, 106 meters, this one period length of the LHC, uh, and then gets connected to, the, to, to, to this line, and then that's repeated every 106 meters. And you can just see one of the, one of the two beam pipes here, and the other one is, is hidden. Of course, interconnects are, are very complicated. Here, here you can see superconducting uh, cables being connected with an ultrasonic uh, brazing machine. Uh, and of course, the quality control of this thing is, uh, has to be absolutely draconian because if you get a bad connection, you will never find it. It will be very difficult to find it with a beam. So uh, the LHC is, is complete in, in, in uh, installation, then started the cool-down, uh, and, and that's quite impressive in itself. The cool-down of the first sector we, we started, I think, was in no November last year, the first sector. Uh, now, from room temperature to 80 Kelvin, we don't use helium. We, uh, we use liquid nitrogen, not in the magnets themselves, but we evaporate liquid nitrogen in the heat exchanger, to cool helium gas, which is then circulated through the magnets. This is much more efficient than switching on our own refrigerators at these temperature levels. And uh, it's pretty impressive. To, to cool down one sector, we need 1,200 tons of, of liquid nitrogen. That's 64 trucks of 20 tons. And since we evaporated at five tons per hour, it means four or five trucks coming day and night continuously during a 10-day period. That's the first point of the cool down. Uh, and here you can see uh, the nitrogen eva being evaporated off in, uh, in, in one of the sectors. Then uh, when we, we go from 80 Kelvin down, down to uh, 4.5 Kelvin, we use the, uh, our refrigerators. This is one of them. There are eight of them. And uh, producing cold gas and then, and then liquid, then filling with liquid. And then once we are full of liquid, we, liquid, we switch on the really sophisticated part which you call the cool compressors, which produce this 15 millibar pressure in all of the heat exchanger tubes around the machine. And there are eight, eight of these as well, taking us down from 4.5 to 1.9 Kelvin. So you see how things went. Uh, the, the first cool down was very long. It was over the Christmas shutdown as well, for, uh, but it was a, a learning period. And then as the other sectors came on, it, it's getting faster and faster. Uh, and now we can cool down in, a, in, about in about five weeks, maybe a little less. And the same thing for warming up. So if we find a fault, if we find a problem that requires warm up of, of a sector, then it, you're talking about three months off. Okay, the, now, uh, this is this, this, I don't know why I start with five, six, but it just <laughs> is like that. This is what's happening uh, today in, in the LHC. Uh, so this is the sector, starting with the sector 5.6, this is 0.5, CMS is, is here, uh, and this is 0.6 where the beam dump is. And you can see the temperatures in the magnets, these are thermometers in the magnets, uh, and as I said earlier, I think that the, the temperature is stable automatically by the superfluid. There cannot be a temperature gradient. So you see that the whole arc so this is three kilometers of arc, is at 1.9 Kelvin. The inner triplet, these are the, uh, the, the quadrupoles that focus the beams down, down to a very fine, the, the um, sigma of the beam size is about 15 microns in the detectors themselves, uh, are cooled also to 1.9 Kelvin. And then the matching sections, which contain separately powered quadrupoles, are cooled to 4.5 Kelvin. This sector, uh, 6-7, is at the moment, is not 
superfluid at, at this moment because we are changing a turbine and uh, by the end of the week we will fix that problem and, and then, then, we will, then we will go superfluid. Sector 7, 8, again you see the same picture. Sector 8, 1, I don't know what happened to the acquisition but it is again uh, completely ready to go. And then the other four sectors uh, are all already uh, basically ready to go apart from cooling down a few box feed boxes uh, and matching region sections. So what are we doing? What are we doing now? Well we are working day and night in in order to commission the hardware now uh, connected to these <coughs> to, 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 to the magnets. Uh, this is the, the main contro the control room. Uh, we are working uh, four, four fronts in parallel, four sectors in parallel, commissioning the power supplies, etc. To understand what it means, this is an example of, of five to six uh, with the inner triplet, the matching section at 4.5 Kelvin and the arc, uh, and a matching section on the 0.6, but it's, it's not like, it's not as sophisticated as this one. And you see, uh, we have 13 circuits here, 14, 157 circuits to deal with here, total 190 circuits for an arc. Each one of them has to be tested individually. Some of them are fairly trivial, but others, others like the main bend, uh, one arc has got a gigajoule in it, so it has to be treated with a considerable amount of respect. And uh, testing out all the quench protection systems, etc. cetera, it, it, that's now going on day and night. And uh, the, the whole of the LEC, all of the arcs, there's something like 1,600 power supplies, uh, which, which have to be all brought up, and that's what's going on now. Once we uh, tested the systems individually, then we have to do a, 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 a global test of an arc. When you accelerate the, LA, uh, the beam in the LEC, everything has to ramp in synchronism. Uh, as, the, as, the main, as the energy goes up, the main dipole uh, field has to rise, the main quadrupole focusing field has to rise in synchronism with it, and all the other elements. So this is a, a test, a real test in the sector 5.6, ramping up to 5 TeV, uh, where you see this is the injection level, 450 GeV, uh, and then the, ra the ramp, it takes about 20 minutes, and all of these, uh, these, these are the main dipoles, and the main quadrupoles, and these are the matching quadrupoles, and chromaticity correction sextiples, all have to, to, to go up in very precise synchronism, uh, and we've checked that, that that is the case. And then the other thing, f forgetting this, is just a flat top, which is not necessary, but then the squeeze. Because we inject, when we inject the beam, and we have it on an optics where the beam is quite big in the uh, in interaction regions, and then we have to squeeze the optics dynamically in order to uh, reduce this, this uh, spot to the size we want for physics. Uh, and there you see it looks pretty chaotic, but I can assure you it, it is not. All the different power supplies going through the squeeze. Um, for the moment, this is also taking us about 20 minutes, and we're trying to reduce this in order to minimize the amount of time that it takes for, for a ramp and squeeze and maximize the time for physics. At point four, we have the uh, radio frequency cavities where uh, they are also superconducting and uh, there, are, there are actually four cavity modules, each with four superconducting cavities in it. So uh, there are eight superconducting cavities per beam and uh, these you, you cannot see, uh, but the uh, two, two of them are displaced radially with respect to the other two. That is, a, there is a beam going through, uh, a beam that goes through a cavity will go through the outside, inside the cryostat, but outside the cavity of the other beam. And uh, this is cooled down to 4.5 Kelvin and, and is, is now being conditioned up to its nominal uh, power for, uh, for operation. One thing that, that is extremely sophisticated is the synchronization between uh, the machines and the, the start of it all is, is the radio frequency system at 0.4 which produces a clock, a, f a 400 megahertz clock which is being distributed first of all to the experiments so the re since it's just 0.4 is near CMS there's a fiber optic link directly to CMS and then through the control room to the other three detectors and also to the upstream machines. 
and uh, this synchronism has to be extremely precise uh, the, when you want to, because you, you, have to, you have to be able to dial in, you have to put, be able to put a bunch within a fraction of a nanosecond at the correct place uh, on the LHC orbit if you want two bunches to collide in the detectors and not elsewhere. So there is a, uh, this is the, uh, one of the most sophisticated things. I think the, uh, the RF of the LHC uh, locks on to the, to the other machines so the LHC tells the PS exactly where the, the, the beam is to be put so that it ends up in the, in the correct bucket, as we call it, in the LHC. And uh, we started to commission this uh, last, last week. I think we found a few problems, but in general, it worked very well. Last weekend, we, the, the, the LHC saw, actually saw the first beam. Uh, this was only a sector test, so we, did, we took a beam from uh, from point two of the LHC, so through the Alice detector, uh, 2.3, so we took a beam three kilometers, and this gave us a lot of, uh, it was uh, 08, 08, 08 last Friday, w which was the start of the Olympic Games, and also the start of the LHC commissioning with the beam. Uh, and, and by nine o'clock in the evening, it was time for uh, Champagne, where we got the beam through on the very first shot. Well, I missed. These are uh, TV screens. This is, this is the, the crudest diagnostic we have, uh, TV screens that we put in the, in, in, in the beam. They're very thin, so they do not affect the beam very much. But then you see a spot, and this was in the injection region, uh, the beam coming in. Through the injection kicker, which it, the beam is, before, if the kicker is not activated, the beam is rising vertically, so it's, lo it's low on one side of the kicker and high on the other. Uh, and finally to the dump. And when we energized the kicker, then it went immediately around three, three kilometers and ended up on this screen, almost, almost good vertically, but displaced by about 15 millimeters horizontally. But that's a terrific result. We never expected to do that in one shot. And this is a picture of the, uh, of the trajectory. So this, these are beam pickups which measure the beam position, plus minus, uh, at different points every 50 meters actually along the orbit uh, and so you can see the, the, the trajectory was only 10 millimeters and w when it was then corrected because there are correctors that, that can uh, uh, bring this down down to a couple of millimeters and that, that was a very very successful weekend uh, looking at the measured position once corrected uh, compared with the theoretical the, the optics is extremely extremely good except there must be a, a polarity reversal in this region, either of a pickup or of a, of a quadrupole, and we are now investigating that to get it right. And again, uh, one thing that you can do very quickly in a machine to see if the op optics is good is to put the, the beam off energy. If, 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 you, if, you, if, you, if you give it an energy error of, a, of, of one per mil, 10 to the minus three, then it will, the beam will be on a displaced orbit, uh, and the, the, the line, the, is the trajectory is, is the theoretical uh, orbit and the points are experimentally measured. So I think that put us uh, and you can also do things like give kicks uh, at, dif at different phase advance and map out the aperture of, of the machine, which is plus or minus 20 millimeters is plenty enough. So uh, the LHC was put up to a flying start, I think, last weekend, and uh, this weekend we will do the same for the other beam. And that, so that by September the 10th, we will be ready then to make the full circulating beam and start commissioning. So the strategy uh, for this year, we are, uh, we are now he here. Beam co commissioning, we will go to 5 TV this year uh, to go fast and also to give us some uh, margin for uh, errors that will inevitably be made, be made in the early days. Uh, operating with a small number of bunches, during the winter shutdown, we will take the machine to its final energy of 7 TV and then start off in 2009 with uh, a, a, the nominal LHC beam. The commissioning steps, uh, well, we'll establish the first turn uh, on September the 10th, getting a circulating beam, commissioning the optics at higher intensity, putting two beams in, then starting to accelerate where there is a region called snapback, which is going to be uh, 
uh, well, I think we've got it well under control, but it's, it's, it's not easy. Getting up to top energy and finally getting on the experimental magnets and getting the f physics program started. And for each of these steps, of course, there is a, a very extensive documentation. Prospects for, for um, well, we, we expect about 30 days to, to do the whole thing. Maybe we will go faster, maybe we will go slower, but I think uh, uh, that's quite reasonable. And what do we expect this year? Realistically, our aims this year are to get something like 10 inverse picobands of integrated luminosity. Uh, and I think there's been an analysis of what physics can be done, and I was surprised how substantial it is with that kind of luminosity. Then next year, of course, uh, then we will really turn up the wick, and we, we expect to get several inverse femtobands uh, in, in 2009. So, I think that, uh, just, just to summarize, uh, the whole machine is now cold and in the final stage of commissioning. I, uh, what is quite remarkable, this project has been 14 years in, in, uh, in construction of both the machine and the detectors, and I think it's true to say that the, both the machine and detectors have converged Remarkably well to termination. I mean, it's, it's not a question of, of the detectors sitting around waiting for the machine to be finished or the other way around. I think we are all, we are all struggling to finish at the same time, and uh, that is really amazing considering the, 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 uh, the long time. Three weeks from now, the first beam will be injected, and the real commissioning of the circulating beam will begin, although it got a jump start, I must say, last weekend, and we will continue the momentum. Uh, the first physics run will be at 10 TV, and we will train the machine up to 14 TV during the winter shutdown. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. I don't see hands.